If you have a Bible, if you open it to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's right after Colossians if you have trouble finding it. And we're going to go to chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians and see what Paul is, is saying to us. And it has a lot to do with the topic, frankly, I probably haven't talked near enough about, and that is the second coming of Christ. We do believe he will be coming back. The Bible tells us that cover to cover. So let's see what uh, Paul wants us to learn today about that and how we're to be alert in light of knowing this about the future. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now in chapter 4, he's been talking about what's, what's going to happen when Jesus returns and some of the details. You can go back and read chapter 4 if you would like. So chapter 5 is where we start now with how we are to be prepared. Let's look at this. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to the darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like others. Stay alert and clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour his anger out on us. Christ died for us so that whether we're dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. And I love verse 11. He finishes the previous chapter the same way. He says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. There's a lot of talk about Jesus coming back, and this tells us that it's gonna happen unexpectedly. There's no way we can know if, if it's gonna happen. There's no way when, we know if, we know, but we don't know when. And there's been all kinds of people through the years, written books with a certain date that of course never happened. And books have had to be recalled, pulled off shelves, reprinted, corrected, and updated. Don't believe anybody who ever says they can know when Jesus is coming back. It's right here. I don't know why people keep trying to do it, but it, no, there is no way we will ever know. It, it will happen like a thief in the night. In other words, you won't expect it. You won't be thinking it's going to happen, and it's going to happen. So now Paul turns the corner and says, here's how we are to live in light of that information. Here's what we're going to do now, knowing that Jesus will come again. Let me ask you a question. If you knew Jesus was coming back by noon tomorrow, let's just for a moment, if you knew that Jesus was going to be coming back by noon tomorrow, where would you be? What would you spend your morning or the rest of our 24 hours, what would you spend that time doing? Who would be with you? Think about that for a minute. I mean, if we, if we knew for certain, which we won't ever know, but just let's just, for the sake of understanding something about ourselves, maybe what we're thinking and how we think, let, let's just for a moment say, it's going to happen tomorrow at noon. So tell me, now that we know it's going to happen tomorrow at noon, what will, we, be, what will we, be, we do differently between now and then? It's kind of like if you knew that tomorrow at noon, your life would be ending. What would you do to get your affairs in order? What do you want to say to people you love? What do you want to get accomplished before you're gone, in other words? If we could predict when that time's going to be. So it's kind of a similar question. It, it probably invokes similar thoughts in our minds. What would I do? What would you do if we knew we had about 26 hours before Jesus showed up? Paul is saying this could happen at any time, but he's saying until then, this is what living 
a Christ-centered life looks like. So he's giving his listeners a, a heavy dose of spiritual reality. So let's kind of plow our way through this. It's on your note page if you want to follow along. Being alert means five things, according to Paul, according to the Bible. First one is this. He says, we're to be clear-headed. We're to be clear-headed. That, I'm reading that out of the, NIV, or the New Living Translation. It says different, uses different words. Sober mind is one term maybe used in the ESV or the NIV. But no, he's saying stay alert and be clear-headed. Colossians 4, printed there on your note page as well, says devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. So Paul is, is really trying to get this point across to us. An alert mind makes a determined effort to stay awake. That's what he's really kind of talking to us. Up to verse five, Paul is kind of lecturing, wants us to understand some things, but then he makes this turn. He wants to make clear two things. We are either asleep, asleep spiritually, or we're not thinking clearly. We're, we're in the dark. He, he uses light and dark by using the idea of that in the light we are living in light, but he uses darkness where we're not thinking clearly. Dark, it means we're, we can be drunk on the whims of the culture. He's not, he's not knocking sleep and he's not saying, it's clearly the Bible says don't be drunk with wine, but he's saying let's not do anything that causes us to not be alert. That would prevent us from thinking clearly. These, these are days we must be careful with. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. They thought he was coming back a lot sooner th than he obviously did. We don't know when that's going to happen. But the Bible's telling us here, here's what you need to be thinking about. Here's how you need to be living before that happens. So he's saying very clearly, we've got to choose to stay awake. Be alert and self-controlled. In other words, clear-headed. And he's saying that people of the light, people who clearly decide and are determined to live a Christ-centered life, they will be alert, clear-headed, awake. And this is something I need you to understand. This is on us. I'm not, you, you know, I'm anti-works-based salvation. I, I'm trying to constantly help people understand you do not have to work your way into the love of Jesus. You don't have to get cleaned up and get good enough so you can walk in a church. I'm, I'm astounded how many people still think that. No, you, you come to Christ as you are, and then he takes it from there and helps you become a brand new person. But there are times, folks, there are times it is up to us to take a step. And Paul is saying here, we choose to be determined to stay spiritually awake and alert in the midst of darkness. And it's a choice that I get to make every day. I can either be in the word every day or not. I can either choose to be alert to when there's darkness around me, or I can be oblivious to it. So he's saying be clear-headed, and that's a, a, a choice we make that I'm going to think clearly, and I'm going to, I'm going to do only what will build up my thinking and help me stay alert, clear-headed, about what's going to happen around me on a daily basis. Being alert secondly means that we live in the light. Verse four says, as for the return of Christ, he says, we won't be surprised. Why? Because we are children of light, the light of Christ. Paul does not say, please be day people. He's saying to the believers he's writing to, you are day people. Now live like it. We don't belong to the night or to darkness. So he says, so, so let's not sleep like the others being oblivious to what's really happening around them, not taking this opportunity to be ready for Jesus and to follow him very serious. Let's not be like them, but let's stay awake and remain in control of ourselves. Because he's saying people who sleep at night and people who get drunk at night, this is what happens in darkness when we're not thinking clearly, we're not being on guard, we're not being alert and awake to the real issues of the world or to darkness, and we're doing things in the darkness that tremendously hinder our ability to be clear-headed. So we want to live in the light. Our intent every day is to live in the light. And we have to understand something. Every day that we wake up, every morning we wake up, there will be a full-on press, full-on court press to throw us off, to catch us off guard, to push us in a direction we weren't equipped to handle. And he's simply saying, we're gonna live 
in the light. Darkness in this text basically is moral and spiritual darkness and blindness. That's what that phrase means about sleeping at night and drinking at night. He says moral and spiritual dark. It's like those, those are examples of, and extremes of moral and spiritual darkness or blindness. In other words, we're oblivious. And here's what's even worse. I mean, I, I, clearly, we probably all know people that we would, might even admit to us. They might even say, no, I'm in the, I live in darkness and I'm good with it. I don't really want to change right now. I don't feel a need to change right now. And they choose to live in darkness and they're good with it. Or I know people then who choose to live in the light. They've been following Jesus a long time. They've decided, I'm going to live in the light of Christ and I'm going to every day take initiative to feed my mind, my heart, and my soul on things that will encourage me in the journey of living in the light of Christ. Because there's a full-on press, you know, to drag us. But here's what I get really worried about these days. I think we have too many people practicing situational living in the light. We'll live in the light when we're at church, around church friends. But we have situational darkness going on. We, We like to kind of veer over and play around in the dark. Thinking it won't hurt us. It's no big deal can't have it both ways. You, you just can't. I, I wish I could tell you something different, but I'm glad I ne- you need to know you can't have it both ways. You're either living in light or you're living in dark. There's, there's nothing in the middle. But we often try to live in the middle and have it both ways. He does not leave us that option. So we want to live in the light. Our intent every day is to do whatever helps us stay in the light and be in touch with the light of Christ Not just saying you want to be in the light, but doing the things people of the day do. And uh, and that would mean we're being light givers if we're walking in the light. We're encouraging others to come into the light with us. Third, living in the light, being alert means uh, we put on the armor. He talks about this. Verse 8, he says, let let those of us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith, love, and wearing our helmet, the confidence or the hope of our salvation. So we put on the armor of faith, love, and hope. One uh, One Christian author that I read frequently said, faith, hope, and love are the triad of essential Christian traits. That's why we've kind of landed on this whole idea that we want to be people who live by faith, uh, be, known, be a voice of hope, and be known by love. Faith, hope, and love. It's, and and I finally, I found something I can memorize. Faith, I just think faith, hope, and love. We live by faith, want to be a voice of hope, and be known by love. Because we exist here. It starts out with a sentence. We exist here to help people find and follow Jesus. That's, that's every reason we do everything we do is we want to help somebody find Jesus and follow him. So Paul is saying, you got to put on some armor. Now let me go to Ephesians chapter 6. Many of you are familiar with this. It's the great text on the armor of God. And Paul, well, he he gave it to the Ephesian church. And he's kind of referring back to this. So let me read to you in chapter uh, 6 of Ephesians at verse 10. He talks about the armor. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Remember their strategies. Well thought out strategies. The evil one knows exactly where to attack us. He knows exactly where to cause doubt in us and fear, anxiety. So put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, he says, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. He refers to that in our text in 1 Thessalonians this morning. Put on the salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He talks a lot about the armor that we're to put on. 
And again, I want to point out, we have to choose to put that armor on. Nobody's going to put it on for us. I mean, it'd be nice to say, oh, Jesus, please put the armor on me, will you? No, no, we, this is where we have to make some choices along the way. It's, he leaves it up to us, you know. God isn't going to force us to him. We, we have to choose. It's our choice here. And we can choose to put that armor on on a daily basis, or we can choose to ignore it. We can choose to add, it'll be okay. No, no, it's up to us to put on the armor that's in front of us, but we have to make a decision. I'm going to put that armor on so I'll be ready for things I may face that I'm not expecting. Verse eight lays out this contrast. Since we belong to the day, let's be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, this hope of salvation as a helmet. And as Christians, he's saying, we gotta be spiritually awake, sober and living in daily anticipation of the Lord's imminent coming. A lot of this is about being ready for Jesus, but a lot of this is about how we live every day as followers of Jesus. And be firm in what we believe and firm in living it out. And Paul uses the metaphor of a soldier. This is one of his favorite illustrations for Christian life. We have the unique responsibility to choose to be prepared for darkness, to come after us, to pursue us, to chase us. A Roman breastplate covered a soldier from basically his neck to his waist, protected most of the vital organs we have. And our, our faith in God is like this hard outside of the armor that protects us. And, and I've read that underneath that armor was a, a soft cloth to warm the body. That's love, which is directed to God and in tenderness toward other people. See, if we have a resilient faith, we will have love for others. In addition, the hope of salvation is the helmet that guards our minds. Guards our minds from things that the enemy will try to interject into our thinking. And he only has one agenda when he interjects those things. And that is to distract us, ultimately to destroy us. I'll be honest with you, there have been times I haven't taken that as serious as I should have. There have been times I didn't realize that behind this pressure we may have been feeling, behind that fiery arrow, was a full-blown agenda to take me out. We've got to be alert. Be alert means, number four, we're committed to prayer. We'll go to Colossians now where Paul kind of says the same thing again. He goes, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. So we're devoted to prayer. Here's what's interesting. You probably know this, but I don't know how often you think about it. You do realize you can pray any time and any place you want to. God's always listening. Prayer is not a conversation that stops. I've, I've never viewed prayer that way. It's an ongoing conversation. Now there are times when we do need to be alone, perhaps kneel at, in prayer at a bedside or at a footstool or at an altar inside of a chapel or the church here. But, but we never hesitate to talk to God anytime, anywhere. And when I see something that reminds me of darkness, if, I, if I'm around circumstances or situations, maybe you, I mean, you can be out at lunch, you can be in the community, you can be driving through town, and you'll see little glimpses of darkness. I tend to talk to God as if he's standing there. and Say, God, please help me to never lose sight of the fact in my very comfortable life as a Christian at Crossings that there's some very real real problems around me. There's a lot of darkness around us. Help me to never lose sight of that. Help me never to lose my resolve that I want to prevent as many people from darkness as I can. What's that look like? What's that mean I need to be doing? Likewise, I, I, if I see somebody that I feel is under-resourced in some way, I, I wonder, am I supposed to do something about this right now? Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. But you bump into people and they're struggling in some way and they need help and help's available, they just don't know it. 
And then I also do the same thing when I see people, when I just see somebody shining some light, somebody being kind, somebody being generous, somebody allowing themselves to be interrupted so they can help someone who needs some help. <clears throat> and I always thank God. Thank you for people like that who don't limit their love for God to the sanctuary or the venue or the chapel. They, they live it out. That's what Paul is saying to us here. Be alert. And let's live this out. Whatever we claim we believe in, in our rooms right now, is it changing the way you live and respond to people between Sundays? Kind of goes back to that question. If you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow at noon, what, you'd be hustling to get some things right, probably. What would they be? That kind of reveals to you areas of your own life that might be a bit of discomfort for you and you've been thinking it could just be okay and it'd go away or whatever, or it didn't matter. Well, you might be realizing now it does matter if it's keeping you from being fully alert and clear-headed and alert to what God wants to do in our lives. And then number five, being alert means we have a thankful heart. He says, Be, devote yourself to prayer alert mind and a thankful heart. And Paul says we enter into prayer then with gratitude. I mean, let's face it for a minute. Just think about this. How awesome is it that we are allowed to talk to the God who made everything? I was out in the yard the other day and I was talking to God. I was saying, God, who made armadillos and why? I was trimming ivy and we got a slew of it. And then you find under the ivy, you find, oh, there's where that critter lives. And you're an armadillo. You just don't get a BB gun out and shoot it. You got to take a ball bat and beat it to death. I mean, but, you know. <laughs> That's some dark thinking, isn't it? You know? <laughs> I can't stand those things. God, why did you make them? What did you have in mind for an armadillo? Why? We have skunks come down the creek. God, why? What was the point? What is the point of a skunk? Unless it reminds us of things that are awful. You know what I mean? What is the point? But, so we have an opportunity to talk to the God that made all this. I don't need to know why. He had a reason, I guess. Why, why mosquitoes? What, why do we need those? Why do you make a mosquito? So, you know, I have all kinds of weird questions for God when I'm burning up and on my hands and knees trimming ivy with little scissors, you know. Maybe it's a heat stroke or something. Who knows what's happening? <clears throat> we have an opportunity to talk to the God that made everything. How amazing is that? Do you ever think about that? That he has made a way for us to talk to him. That he sent Jesus to this earth so we would have a picture of him, of what he's like and how much he loves us. He didn't have to do that. But, but he sent his son in his likeness, it says, so we would know that he loves us, that he's available to us, that we can call on him anytime. How amazing is that? He never falls asleep. He's never unavailable. He requires no appointment. Think about it. Is that not amazing? He, he, he says he's got the hair on our head, the hairs on our head numbered. And so those of you who don't have any hair, he's got other things numbered for you. Or maybe you're easier to spot. You know, the guys that don't have any, he can spot you easy. So he's got you covered. Don't worry about not having hair. But think about it. God's available. He, he keeps inviting us. Talk to me. I'm here for you. Let's talk. So we are to be, we're, devote, we're, we're to devote ourselves to prayer. Now there again, I've got to, I've got to take that initiative. I, I'm not going to pray, God, will you help me devote myself to prayer? <laughs> God goes, no, you decide if you're going to devote yourself to prayer or not. You, you make it a priority in your life. That's on you. That's your call. I'll give you the strength to do it, but you've got to do your part. You've got to get up. You've got to stop whatever's going on when you feel the need to pray. And you've got to talk. He's available to us. What a privilege that is. You know, I almost, I thought today about starting this message. I was just going to read the text and say, okay, that's what the Bible says. Just go do it. Let's pray. I, was, I mean, I was so tempted to do that that way. 
30 second sermon. I was going to tell you that at the beginning, and then I got to thinking, you'd be looking at your watch the whole time. So I, I didn't go, but this is one of those prayers. It's just so simple. It's obvious. It's right in front of us. You, you can go define it in the Greek and Hebrew all you want, but it's pretty clear what it's saying to us. Be devoted, be watchful, be alert. Pray with an alert mind. Be thankful. Be prepared that you're going to face the enemy all the time because he prowls around trying to destroy us. He's told us that in advance. We know that already. This isn't new news. So I predict most everyone in this room probably would like to be alert and clear-headed and live in the light of Christ if you're not already. I I predict you're interested in spiritual armor protecting your life from life's troubles and temptations, enjoying times every day where you just talk to your Father in heaven and, and live filled with gratitude Somewhere at some point in your life, somebody told you about how much Jesus loved you, how he wanted really, he noticed you, he, has, he wants a relationship with you, nothing about you surprises him, he knows everything. That, that overwhelms me, I say it all the time. God, I, how can we thank you that you know everything about us and yet you still love us? Everything about us, he knows. And he still chooses to love us. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want the inner strength to do the right thing even when we're tempted to do something that may seem a little more fun? Ah, this won't hurt anything. That's why we need to be alert. uh, Paul said Jesus is coming back. We don't know when it'll be, but we sure will be ready. And beyond that, it's not that that he's coming back someday and he to live in sheer terror that when it happens, I'm ready. You, there's a way to be ready. That, that's that's real, actually kind of simple. It's how are we going to live between now and then? Are we going to live a Christ-centered life, living in the light of Christ, the life He's welcomed us to live and empowered us through His Spirit to live? That's why we need to be alert. He's promised He's coming back, but in between now and then, there's a way to live with as much joy as is possible on planet earth because the devil is prowling around trying to destroy us at every turn. A couple of years ago, uh, it's been many years ago now, probably seven, eight years ago, there was an article in USA Today. And I clipped it and put it in the files because the headline was amazing. There were a lot of fires going on even then in California. And uh, unfortunately, there's still fires these days. But here's what the article was titled. Hesitation is a fatal mistake. That was the title of the article. And it talked about people who were being warned in advance to leave. They were watching the news coverage on their own TVs about how close the fires were getting. And they were being told it's time to evacuate, mandatory evacuation. But they waited In fact, that firestorm, that particular one, claimed over two dozen lives, 24 people died. They interviewed some people in that article. One of them was a sergeant. He was pretty frustrated with people who were being warned to leave because it was dangerous, and they didn't listen. Here's what he said. We're begging people to leave. We're begging people, and they won't take us seriously. They want to pack up some clothes or grab some things or fight the fire in their backyard with a garden hose. Another guy told of frantically warning his neighbors only to have some of them disregard him or respond sort of casually. He told of people he wanted to save but they wanted to get their TV sets or they wanted to grab their computer or their laptop or their iPhone or all that stuff. He said they looked like they were packing for a trip. And he said the people who fled when they were told to flee lived and the ones who didn't died. Hesitation is a fatal mistake. Barkley, it's on your note page, I think. William Barkley said, it's too late to prepare for the exam when it's in front of you. I've tried it. (laughs) Didn't work out too well. So if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you want to get accomplished before then? Where do you want to be when that happens? Where do you want to be? Or maybe the other question is, where do you want to be sure not to be when that would happen? 
The way you answer that question may give you something to think about. Why not live like Jesus has called us to live all the time? James Earl Massey is just a great, great theologian. He was a friend of my dad's. I talked about him, I think, a few weeks ago, and I've, I've uh, written a blog about him. Just a giant, just a giant of a, a gracious, kind, uh, brilliant man. I, I told you, he was the first call I got when my dad died. And it's on, the, on your note page. God calls us into pilgrimage in his will. The crucial response is to give God our full consent granting him freedom to guide our lives. With our consent, God will take us from where we are to where we ought to go, shaping and using us by his wiser plan. So I thought today would be a good day for me to pose a que another question. Have you made a clear decision, a clear choice, you know you've made it, you might could remember when you made it, that you are going to be following Jesus Christ, you've invited him to be the light of your life. That's a decision that you have to make. And I fear there are those who don't realize how serious the decision is, and you kind of want Jesus in a paper bag, kind of like your lunch. It's there when you need him, there when you get around to it, living the life he calls us to live. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try hard, you know, but, but wait a minute. Have, have you asked Jesus to take your life, to fill it with his light, and to follow him and trust him. And if you haven't, you need to make a decision. You know, I don't like to push people. We got a lot of people in this church, got a lot of questions yet to be answered. I'm glad we have that. But there's a time when you've got all the facts you're gonna get, what are you gonna do with it? Are, are you ready to say, okay, I need to get off the fence. I wanna live clear-headed, I wanna be alert. I wanna live like Christ has shown me to live. I need to be prepared for the enemy who's on constant attack. I need to put that armor on that he offers me. Are you ready for that? And I just would hope and pray that if there's anybody in our rooms today who's unclear about that or they're not sure they've ever made that decision, I would encourage you to make the decision today. What are you waiting for? I'm gonna call our prayer teams forward in all our rooms. I'm gonna close in prayer here in just a moment. And when I close in prayer, uh, please feel free as people walk out the doors of these rooms, feel free to come toward the front of the rooms and there'll be people there to pray for you about whatever is on your mind. And as I always say, it may have nothing to do with the message today. You may be carrying another burden of some other kind, but I want you to know you can leave here with clarity. You can leave here knowing you've been prayed for or somebody you love has been prayed for. And if you've not made it clear that Jesus is gonna be the center of your life, this is a great day to do that. And all I'd ask you, it's on you. We're not going to give you paperwork to fill out. All I would ask, you would just let somebody know. One, so we can pray for you. Two, so we could probably send you some things that'll help you get started. But today may be the day that you finally decide, okay, can't have it both ways. It's time to follow Jesus and let him have my life and fill my life with his light. Let's stand as we pray together. Father God, we're so thankful uh, for this book. We're so thankful, Father, that Jesus has come and he visited this planet and this book records some of the things that happened when the living word showed up among us, loved us, showed us what you, God, are like, gave us an, another idea of how to live our life. Father, we know we really do know at the end of the day, we're all smart enough people to know that living the Christ-centered life is the best life to live. There's nothing else like it. Father, I pray that you'd forgive those who are trying to have it both ways. I pray, Father, you would help remind us who are in Christ what a privilege we have to know this truth. And I pray you would never let us resist the opportunity to share somebody with this light of Christ, to share with them this news that has changed our life. So Father, today, we want to be alert and be clear-headed and be ready for whatever comes at us. Thank you, God, that you love us enough to tell us this and to call us to something greater 
and something higher. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.